Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about building serverless espresso. You may have heard it in the keynote this morning, and building these sorts of applications with event-driven architectures. We've got about 50 minutes together. I'm going to be talking about what it's like building a real-life production application that we developed in our team, and focus on some of the practical aspects of building EDA apps within AWS. So my name is James Bezik. I'm a developer advocate. I run the DA team for AWS Serverless. So if you know people like Eric Johnson and Marcia Vishalba, they're all on my team, and we built this together. Prior to being a DA, I was actually a serverless geek. I've been building fairly large serverless applications for several years. But I was a software engineer for a long time and also a product manager. The most important thing on this slide is that long after the dust have settled of, of reInvent is my email address, my Twitter handle, and also LinkedIn. So if you have any questions as you build these applications in the future, feel free to reach out to me, and I'll do my very best to help. So we're going to cover four things today. I'm going to give you a quick intro to Serverless Espresso in case you've not seen it in the expo hall. I'll talk about some of the design decisions that we went through in putting the application together, how it started out, some of the mistakes we made feature by feature until it actually worked, the lessons we learned along the way, and also useful patterns that I hope you can use in your own EDA applications. Now, at the very end of the presentation, there's a resources link that will give you a link to the deck and the code and everything else. So you're welcome to take photos as we go, but you really don't have to. So Serverless Espresso is an event-driven coffee ordering app that we built with serverless architecture. We first announced this in reInvent last year, and we really didn't know how popular it would be. We ended up doing 1,900 drinks over the course of the conference, peaking at 71 drinks per hour. Since then, we've been at AWS summits from Paris to Milan, New York, Stockholm, all over the world. We also launched at the EDA Day in London in September, and we've been at GoTo conferences and many others as well. On average, after 26 events, we do about 1,000 drinks per day. So what is the flow? Well, essentially, you walk up to the booth with your cell phone. There's a QR code that changes on the screen behind you. You scan that QR code with your phone, log in with your phone number. That loads the menu, and you place your order. You'll see the order appear on the screens around you, and as, there is, as the order gets produced, you'll see notifications that go to the screens and also to the phone in your pocket. You also get a cup of coffee at the end. That's the key part of this whole thing. I'll give you a quick walkthrough of the apps, in, just in case you've not seen it already. But this is the, dis the display web app. This is what's on the screen behind the baristas. This shows a dynamic barcode that changes every five minutes. It shows the order status of orders in the queue, drinks that are ready. It also responds to global events like the store being opened and closed. The ordering web app, this is what the customer uses with the phone in their pocket. They scan the QR code on the screen. And then once they've logged in, they see a menu where they select the drink what they want, that they want, so latte, cappuccino, whatever it might be, which, whatever modifiers they prefer. Once they hit submit, they get an order number. And then when the barista starts making the drink, that then gets the notification, indicates it's in a pending status. And then finally, when it's ready, they get another notification. There's also a link on this screen that shows you a unique coffee journey, all the steps that your journey, your coffee went through in terms of events. And finally, we have this barista web app. Now, the barista only interacts with the tablet. They don't actually talk to the customers coming to the booth. So this tablet gives them a list of all the upcoming orders. It enables them to move the orders into a pending or complete status. They can also take other actions in case they need to cancel the order, too. There are a couple of admin actions available, too, opening and closing the store. And this connects to a thermal printer. So if you've seen the, the tickets they produce, they're coming from this application as well. So all of this is made with really relatively few AWS services. We've got Amazon uh, AP, AWS Amplify Console, which is used to deploy the web apps. So we deploy the web apps, we, we commit the web apps into uh, GitHub repos, and then Amplify detects any time we make changes and deploys those out for us. API Gateway is used to secure the back end, and we're using SMS login through Cognito to do this. DynamoDB is the storage used by every microservice, and every coffee drink is actually stored as an item in a DynamoDB table. EventBridge and Step Functions is primarily what I'll be talking about, so I'll, I'll get to that shortly. But the real-time connection back to the front end is achieved with IoT Core. That's essentially like a serverless WebSocket service. And then any custom code we want to use, we use AWS Lambda. 
Now, I'm not going to talk about what these services actually do because this is a 300 level talk that gives you an idea of the scope of what's involved. So those are the finished UIs that customers have been using and you, you might have seen downstairs. But of course, nothing works without the back end. In this section, I'm going to talk you through what we started building out before everything worked. So first of all, we sat down with the team and we came up with some guidelines about what we thought we needed when we built this application. We knew that we needed minimal code, that um, code is a liability, especially my code. I think most applications with, with less code are easier to maintain and manage, so we knew that was a primary goal. Extensibility was important because when we built this, this was in my office floor during the pandemic. I didn't really know what it needed to do. So as we've done more events, we've changed the functionality. And so being able to add and change what the application is capable of is really important. Scalability, for the same reason, is also important. I didn't know if people would sell 10 drinks, 100 drinks, or 1,000 drinks. As it turned out, we had five events in one day this year. So we did 5,000 drinks in one day. So I needed a system that's scalable, that can handle the volume without knowing in advance what the volume is. And then perhaps most importantly, I needed something that's cost efficient. I think too often we don't talk about this. But you know, as developers, cost is really important. And I wanted to build something that, when it was finished, I could say to you, I really believe this is the most cost-effective way of building this app. We also had some tenets. So each team member was responsible for one component. We had no implementation sharing. And you had to make sure that your component or your microservice had an API, or it could communicate by either publishing or consuming events. You couldn't go poking into other people's DynamoDB tables, for example. And we stuck to those tenets throughout the development. So we locked ourselves in a room with a whiteboard, and we figured out what is actually the workflow of this application. We came down to seven basic steps that we knew had to happen. First, we knew the customer scans the barcode. And then they, we have to check if the store is open. Then we check that the barista has capacity. They're not currently swamped. They can take the order into the queue. Then we wait for the customer to select the drink that they want from the front end. We give them up to five minutes to do this. Otherwise, we time out the order and return the token so that someone else can place an order. We then generate an order number, which you know, is something human readable that a barista can shout, one, two, three, not, not the GUIDs that we're using internally. And then we wait for the barista to make the drink. And we give them 15 minutes to do this. And the reason for this is this is a tech demo. It's not really a coffee shop. So if it takes more than 15 minutes, we apologize and move on. But it's really a safety valve in the system. And finally, we knew we needed to handle cancellations by the customers or by the baristas. For a variety of reasons, people can cancel orders. So we took everything here, and then we decided to write this in pseudocode. So we took these, some of the steps, and you see on the left here, we've got this order acceptance idea, where I've got some nested logic that checks if the store is open, it, see, it checks if the barista is busy, saves to DynamoDB or rejects the order. Then on the right-hand side, we're thinking about how to manage timeouts. We need some sort of something that runs every minute, maybe an event bridge schedule rule to fire off a Lambda function. We could then scan a DynamoDB table and measure the difference in time between now and the last action on order. And as we're writing all this, this just feels also wrong. It's just not the right way to do this. And we realize this is a very fragile approach, what we're doing. What we're doing is we're building a state machine. And so this didn't meet the requirements of the low-code solution that we wanted to implement. And it's probably not very extensible either. When I've written things in the past like this before, when you come back three months later, you don't really remember the logic of what you've built. Also, if the wait time was 90 seconds instead of five minutes, this doesn't work because I can only check every minute. I can't check with one second granularity. So no real part of this is solving what we need. And then finally, it's not really clear how it works for thousands of orders because the logic here actually slows down as the number of orders increases. So if we had a system that needs to handle tens of thousands of orders, this might not, not work at all. So we did away with that. And instead, we turned to a fairly new feature in step functions at the time called Workflow Studio. So we built out this workflow using this drag and snap interface that is a really easy way to build the ASL file that powers your workflow. And within really just a few hours, we were able to model what we had on the board into this design. So we replaced all that spaghetti pseudocode. And then we quickly were able to use a sample payload to test to make sure that the, the work, workflow is behaving as we expected. 
You'll notice we emitted events at key places. So if the shop was not ready, that emits an event. We don't know exactly what we have to do yet, but we just put that there so that we could take action later. So in version one of this workflow, you see the quite a few Lambda functions here, and it really models what I showed you in a few slides ago. In the first step, it checks to see if the shop is open. We figured we had to do that because of a possible race condition between the front end and the back end, where just at the point you close the store, it's possible someone sneaks an order in the front end, so you need to really check each time. We also then uh, handle the timeouts very elegantly using a single state transition that creates a task token. And all we have to do is set a heartbeat so that we can say if we want to wait five minutes or 15 minutes, we can follow a timeout path. Now, we don't need to table scan anything, and there's no code to implement that. That's actually a native part of step functions. We're still using Lambda for custom logic. So in the capacity status function there, we're using the SDK to query step functions to find the total number of running functions. And we generated order numbers by uh, to create sequential IDs by using a DynamoDB table with, a, with an atomic counter. So this was our version one of the workflow. And by the end of version one, we've got this very basic workflow that kind of acts like a conveyor belt for the drink. It performs very simple checks. It waits for the customer at the right point. It waits for the barista at the right point. It handles the timeouts, and it emits events as needed. So we take this workflow, and we put it into our design. And so the architecture so far is our workflow on the right, talking to EventBridge with a couple of those events were, that were emitted. There's no front-end applications. Not sure what the question mark is yet. That's pretty much where we are. Now, we knew that we wanted this QR code to start the order. And originally, we were thinking about just printing something and putting something static on the wall. Then we had this thought that maybe someone would post it on Reddit, and we might get lots of orders from people who are not at the conference. So uh, that didn't seem like such a good idea. And we thought, well, what about the dynamic code that changes every few minutes? So if it does get shared, you've really limited the amount of time where you've been exposed. So this is how the QR validator service was born. We also realized with events, we could do something kind of clever. We could count the number of scans fairly easily and use this to limit the number of orders that were accepted into the system. So with serverless systems, serverless systems scale very quickly. And whenever you're using downstream systems that don't scale like this, you have to be a bit careful. And in this case, our downstream system is a human barista we have to protect. So we want to make sure that the, the human barista making a coffee doesn't get overwhelmed with orders. And so by doing it this way, we could set up a system where the QR code could vanish when it hits a certain number, and it would give them time to catch up. So what does this look like? So going back to our architecture, this QR validator service has a REST API, so the front end could call this, and it emits events to the event bus. Now, initially, we used Postman for testing, but we then decided we wanted to build a skeleton of the front end just to get a feeling of what this would look like. So we started with our ordering app and our display app, and then that's going to use two endpoints within the validator service. So inside the validator service, there's a generate endpoint. This is used by the admin functions. It's a protected admin route. And when this is called, it then creates a QR code, which is simply a random number. And it splits the day into five-minute buckets. So any time you call in that five-minute window, it'll either generate a random number or return the one that was created in the same window. That ID is then stored in a DynamoDB table that's local to this service. The ordering app then calls the validate endpoint. This endpoint is called when your phone's barcode scanner interprets the barcode and it attaches the ID as a query parameter to the end of the API gateway endpoint. And this just returns a success or failure. It's either a successful code or not. But if it is successful, it then emits this event with your user ID, and that's what starts the workflow for the coffee processing order. Inside the Dynamo DB table, in case you're interested, this is what it looked like. So the key parts here is we've got a last code attribute. And this is a GSI, where we simply store that code so we can quickly look it up. We've got to start and end uh, timestamp for the given bucket of time in the day. And then most importantly, there's an available tokens number, which starts at 10. And we simply decrement that every time this is scanned. So at this point, we've got this endpoint that handles the IDs for the QR code. And it, the event can trigger the workflow. But now we need a way to interact with the orders. So customers can update and cancel orders. 
baristas can complete and cancel orders. The task tokens that are generated by the workflow need to be stored somewhere. And then we've got a display app and a barista app that needs a way to get a list of open and completed orders from somewhere. And so we've wondered about how to approach this, and we came up with some questions. Should we build a monolithic workflow? Well, because it involved a whiteboard, we had to try. So we went to the whiteboard and built out this massive workflow showing literally everything you can think of that would happen with a coffee order. And once we got to about 100 boxes, we thought this is a terrible idea because we're building microservices to escape monoliths, not build a monolith in a step function's workflow. So we quickly abandoned this one. With the task tokens, we've thought about keeping those at the client because you've, the client is really responsible for restarting the task in many cases. But then that didn't really feel right because if someone clears the cache on their browser or they switch browsers, you're storing a piece of data that's only used by the back end at the front end. So we decided not to do that. And then we wondered about querying all open workflows just to see what the list of open ones were. But the problem with this is as you have more and more of these, this process starts to slow down. It's not really a very efficient approach to the problem. So instead, we decided to use a microservice whose job was to do all of these things. And that brings us to the order manager microservice. And so it fits into the infrastructure here. It has a REST API endpoint for the UIs, and it consumes and emits events to the event bus. And so when a workflow now emits a task token, it receives this and stores this in its own DynamoDB table. So inside, this is a standard serverless microservice. It's got, it consists of API Gateway, Lambda, and DynamoDB. It saves each order to this DynamoDB table. It listens to events whenever the order status changes. It's simply receiving events from the event bus. It stores that task token so that it never goes outside of the back end. And then you'll see there's a GSI uh, called order state on the table. So if we quickly need a list of all open or completed orders, it's provided by this service with very low latency. Now in version one of this, each of the main functions we had in this service was handled by API Gateway with a Lambda function. And so if you cancel an order, it updates DynamoDB and resumes the step function. If you complete an order, it updates DynamoDB and resumes the step function. And you'll start to see this is very repetitive as you go on. And so we used this for a while, but we found this was fairly complex because you've got really very much um, duplicative code living in different directories. It's hard to navigate and understand really what's going on. And you have poor discoverability with this approach. And it's, it's actually fairly complex, even with a few number of endpoints like this. So we went to version 1.5 where we decided that many of the Lambda functions are really just reading or writing to a DynamoDB table. And instead, we had this idea. You could basically remove the Lambda function and use a direct integration between those two services. And we can do that using VTL. We can map, map a template from the API gateway request directly to the table. This has a few interesting benefits. So this can reduce your cost, because you're taking out a Lambda function. It reduces latency, because you've removed one service in the process. It reduces quite a lot of code and complexity, and it can increase your scale. It's not really that necessary in our case, but you can imagine in larger cases with this type of need that putting these two services together can make the service that much more scalable. So of course we didn't stop there. We, we decided then to look at this put operation we had, where this is a little bit more tricky because we have to make sure that when the coffee drink arrives, it matches something that's in our menu, and the menu changes, so there's a bit more complexity involved. And we, we could have left it as is, but we decided to see if we could make this work with its own step functions workflow. So the put um, method now it was an API gateway to step functions integration. And we felt pretty pleased about this, because this took a lot of code out of the solution, which you know, met one of our guidelines of having a low code solution. But then we had a new thought. We thought, actually, what if the whole microservice could just be a CRUD microservice that lives in step functions. So you know, of course, we had to do that. So we tested this out. And we built a workflow that got rid of all the previous work. And instead, what it does is it, in the very first integration with, with API Gateway, the first transition, it looks at what step it needs to do, create, read, update, or delete. It follows one of those paths. And you'll see there's only one Lambda function on the left side, and all the rest of them are gone. We found some huge benefits doing this. It's really surprising. So this big microservice we had 
basically got shrunk down to one ASL file plus a you know, minor lambda function. We found this could be a fairly useful pattern for CRUD microservices generally, since they're, you know, really they're very common. When it was running, it was much easier to trace and debug. We could see exactly where things were failing and what was going wrong. This could be much more cost effective in many cases too. If you're pulling out Lambda functions and compute, you can use these direct service integrations and that also reduces the latency as well of running through the workflow. Potentially, you could also use Express. So that was how the order manager service ended up in version two. So at this point, we've got a way for the order workflow to start and interact with the order, but nothing keeps the front ends up to date. So we need to keep the web apps in sync with the orders. We need to respond to issues like the store opening and closing. We need to really do this as close to real time as possible and be resilient enough to handle network dropouts and missed messages, because all of this is running on cell phones at conferences with Wi-Fi, so we have to think about that too. So we looked at several options here. Should we create a polling API? We could create second APIs where the front ends just poll this with a transaction ID to see if the order is ready. Or what about using a mechanism like SMS instead? We could do away with, with really doing much in the front end and just send the customer a text message saying your drink is now ready. That's possible. Or what about using API gateway web, web sockets when you first make your order or your request through the API gateway endpoint? Keep the connection open and send data back. And so we evaluated each of these. Let's take a bit of a dive into this problem in a little bit more detail though. So when you're dealing with asynchronous flows, there's a bit of a problem to handle here. So your client makes a call to service A. Service A calls service B, and the client has no way of knowing what happened. Was there an error? Was it successful? Did it fail? Who knows? And this is a general problem we've had in these asynchronous flows really since, you know, for decades. And so the traditional method to approach this is polling. And so this is the technology equivalent of having your kids in the back of the car saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And the difficulty with this, it's very easy to implement, but there's a lot of empty requests. You know, if you are polling once a minute and you have randomly distributed events coming back to your front end, on average, you'll be out of date by 30 seconds. What can you do to shorten this? Well, you could poll every 30 seconds, reduce it to 15 seconds, or poll every 10 seconds. And we see customers doing this. They shorten the polling window to solve this problem. But you're just creating more and more empty requests, increasing your own costs, and you're still not real time. So really, the solution to this is a WebSocket. And you know, your customers who use web apps are used to using email clients and maps applications that are you know, pretty much close to real time. This is the sort of functionality we need to be building. And with a WebSocket, you create this bi-directional connection where you can send data continuously as things change. It's much less chatty, it's close to real time, but there's a snag, it's complicated. But the good news is that if you use IoT Core, that actually abstracts away a lot of the complexity for you. So we use this for tasks uh, where you've got completion percentages like coffee orders, for example. And so you're not limited to send, sending a single response like you are with an API call. You can keep sending data back and updating the UI accordingly. So looking at this in a bit of detail, you can think of IoT Core as really a WebSocket service for serverless in this context. And it uses the MQTT protocol, which is all based around topics. So first, your front end subscribes to those topics when it starts up. And in our case, we've got this publisher microservice that's listening to events coming off the bus that's going to send those to those topics it's interested in. It publishes to those topics. And one of the great benefits to this is if I've got 100 or 1,000 clients needing to know when the story is open or closed or they're listening for information, IoT Core handles that fan out for me. I only need to send the message once. It does it all in the background. Also, a lot of the reconnection logic is bundled into the SDK. It's code I don't have to write. I'm a big fan of not writing code. So there's lots of great functionality here, and this is something that's a great way to continue that event journey from the back end back to your front end. So in the front end, if you're using something like a Vue.js or React or Angular application, Serverless Espresso is Vue.js, what you do to handle this is write handlers. Now, I've omitted a bit of the code at the top that shows you how to form the connection. If you go to the resources page at the end, you can download all the code and see this, but I wanted to highlight the critical handlers. You have to handle when the connection is formed, 
or when an error occurs, but the critical one is the payload you receive when data changes. And so in our case, it's very simple when you get a message saying a cup of coffee is ready to then receive this message. And using Vue.js, I simply update the data model in the component, and then the framework updates the UI for me. So there's surprisingly little code in the front end that continues this real-time journey all the way through. So this all came together to really come create this publisher microservice, which actually is only about 20 lines of code on the back end. And then we let all the fan out get handled by IoT Core to give us this near real-time response to potentially thousands of devices. It listens to this event bus in the middle, finds messages it's interested in, and forwards them on. And then most importantly, it lets us continue this EDA journey back to the front end without relying on polling. One important thing I wanted to throw in here is you can actually combine a couple of approaches here uh, that, that can solve some complex problems. So when your application first starts up, and it can start up any time, you know, on a phone, your phone might, may suspend the app, or customers can F5 a browser. For any number of reasons, it, it can start up at any moment. You really want to receive the state of the world right now from an API endpoint, not a WebSocket. But you want to receive the deltas from the WebSocket, from that point forward, tell me all the things that have changed. And the combination of those two things is extraordinarily powerful, because at any point in time, you can just start up, form the connection with the WebSocket, while at the same time fetching current state through via the API. So the final architecture looked like this. We had this complete loop going all the way around. You've got your QR scan and orders coming in over these API requests. The processing happens in our step functions workflows. And then the results go back out over this publisher service. And EventBridge choreographs all of this using events flowing between the components. It's very low code. It's very flexible. It's very extensible. There are other microservices I'm not showing here just to keep the slides simple, but they all follow the same model of living on the left-hand side. And they've either got APIs or they've got events they're producing or consuming to be part of this system. So in any software project, you, know, you face a lot of choices and decisions you have to make. You make a lot of mistakes as well, and lessons that you can bring to future projects. And so I wanted to share some with you, because this was the first EDA project we built in a production scenario. And maybe some of these things you can find useful as you get into this journey as well. I've been talking about events so far, but really, what are they? So we know that producers create events. Consumers have no control over their contents, which is reverse of the API world when you think about it. Normally, you're targeting an API that returns information to you. An event is actually just JSON. So if you can write JSON, you can write an event. There's nothing actually that special about it. It has this envelope that you see on the outside that is provided by EventBridge. And then the parts in blue are what you need to provide. This is the detail, detail type, and source attributes. It's entirely your choice. Of course, being entirely your choice, this means you need to make some decisions fairly early on. In your detail, should you have fat events or thin events? What do I mean by that? Well, essentially, imagine something like an order ID we're passing around. Should that contain just an order ID, a thin event, a number? Or should it contain details of the coffee order, the user, the type of milk, and absolutely everything else in the order to make your event bigger? And the right answer to this actually will depend upon what you're building. But it's a question you need to ask fairly early on. Also, what about metadata like versioning, especially in the development phase where actually you're changing your events. You're going from version 1 to 2 to 3 fairly quickly. You may be adding attributes, removing them. You may break your consumers if you're not careful, especially since you may not know who they are. And so you might want to include versioning in that event data as well, just to make it easier for consumers to understand what's going on. So events are immutable, they're observable, and they're temporal when they happen matters. And so what events, knowing that, should you then generate? So we went through all the microservices we had. I think in the end we had 16 or so events we were generating. And here is the main list, but the critical thing is that we're not using all of them yet. And again, that's counterintuitive if you come from the API world, because you don't generally build APIs with the intention of no one using them. But with events, if you publish an event, future you or future team you're working with may find that event useful. So it's actually useful to put the event onto the bus. So publishing more events than you think you need can help with extensibility. 
Also, step functions does generate some events automatically, whether you intend to do that or not. So you can consume and use some of those, and you can manually create events from step functions, as we did earlier, so that's, that's useful too. And then thinking about naming conventions early was also important, because you've got different teams, and you've got this flexibility. We settled on microservice.thing that happened to, to stress that an event is a thing in the past. So in other words, if an order gets canceled, that doesn't undo the order creation event. That simply means you've got a second event canceling the order. You can choose to name these things anything you want, but I think coming up with a convention for your team early on can really help. For EventBridge, another question we came up with fairly early was, do you want one bus or two? And this is a great question because you've got this default event bus that lives in your account. You already have it. And that's the only destination available for AWS events. You can send events there too. But sending events there aids discoverability for other people using your events in the future. Whereas if you decide to use a custom event bus, then what you're doing is, this is you're using this as like a security boundary around the events you produce and deciding who can control. And so this is the trade-off between the two. Other teams may not be able to see events if you put them in a custom bus, but you may not want people to see events if you put them in a default bus. There are actually lots of security options around EventBridge to secure things in different ways, but very broadly, this is the trade-off you make in the one bus or two question. So events also do change in development, and you want to use versioning, as I mentioned, so that you can implement some form of contract to avoid breaking your consumers. And so we used EventBridge schema registry to keep track of our events. All you have to do is turn that on, and it automatically monitors what's going through the bus and gives you a registry of what's happening. There's also some really good open source tools. So someone on my team called David Boyne built this before he joined AWS. It's a tool called Atlas. And we use this to visualize the flow of events, because when you're in the dev phase, you need, really need to know who's producing them and who's consuming them. And it's got this very elegant UI where you can see what's going on. So that we found incredibly helpful too. So generally, you'd want to think about documenting these events fairly early on, because it starts to become overwhelming otherwise if you don't do this. When we started testing the application, this again was something that was a bit new to us, because we're used to having API endpoints where we use something like artillery to set up a load of tests to that endpoint. And I'm not sure if you've done this, but often that means if you've got a secure endpoint, you have to go and find the JSON web token from somewhere and make artillery use it. And it, go, it then times out when you need it next time. And it's all a little bit awkward. What we found with this is we could inject our test or our events after the API point in the microservice. And so actually, we could just play events into the bus as if they'd come through the API. And we skipped that completely. We then got even more fancy. We decided to build a robot tester as a microservice. It was a piece of extensibility we developed because we wanted to stress test the system with thousands of orders. And so our robot microservice produced and filled orders. It was both a customer and a barista. Very easy to write in this type of environment. We are able to use archive and replay capability in EventBridge too. So with this, you simply turn on the archive. We went to a summit, looked at 1,000 orders coming through the system, and recorded this in our archive. Then in future, when we made changes to the application, we simply played those events in our development account against effectively production data so we could get a sense of how the application now works if it were in a production space. Very, very easy to set up. Also on the bus, one neat trick I found was you could create one rule that sends all of your events to a CloudWatch logs location. And then in the CLI, you can tail that log file. It's much like the, the old days of a server where you can tail a log file, but it gives you a sense of everything that's flowing through the bus visually. You probably don't want to do this in production due to the volume of traffic, but in dev and test, it's incredibly helpful. So when you're communicating between microservices this way, the event flow is really driving the application, which again is hard to initially get your head around if you come from the API space. Events are choreographing the services while step functions is orchestrating the transactions. And there's an important separation between the two that took a while for us to figure out exactly where the line was. We also very quickly decided we didn't need private APIs because you know, private APIs require more setup with VPC configurations. We didn't need this in this model at all. All the APIs were simply open for the outside world. But anytime we needed a private microservice, it just needed to communicate with events because by default, those are private. 
When we added more microservices as requirements changed, we simply plugged those in on the left. That didn't change any of the code for existing services. And in fact, about a week before reInvent happened, somebody had a great idea of this order journey microservice, something that would give customers the idea of every step taken for their cup of coffee. And we thought it was a great idea, but we panicked, thinking, you know, do we really want to be changing all the code before reInvent? And then we realized with this model, actually, it's just another microservice. And we wrote the whole solution in about three hours. It simply listens to the events, produces a report, and gives it to the front end. And all of these microservices are emitting events to the bus. But here's the amazing thing. They don't know about each other. None of these services know or care about each other. They are truly, truly decoupled. And this makes the code base much, much simpler as you're adding more features. Here's another thing we learned, so breaking up monolithic deployments. In our early phases of this, we had one gigantic SAM template with absolutely everything in it. And we had one point where we had to change Cognito from email to SMS. And that required us to take down the whole stack and re redeploy from scratch. And so we looked at this idea of, well, can we break this up into smaller composable pieces? And so instead, we built a SAM template for some resources like Cognito, the IoT thing, and the event bus, things that largely aren't going to change, but every, they're used by everything. Each one of these microservices was then its own SAM template with a rule that listened to events off the bus. And then the same with the order processing workflow. That was its own SAM template as, as well. And this made it much faster and much safer to deploy changes to these microservices. So there were a few useful patterns as well that emerged that I think we can use in future projects. And hopefully, you can find these useful as well. So CQRS is this concept about separating the paths between updating and reading data, broadly speaking. It's very, very powerful in asynchronous design and can help you build very scalable services. So where you have front ends or callers outside of the AWS cloud, consider how you can make this work. Now, our publisher service uses IoT Core to complete that feedback cycle to get data all the way back to the client. And this is useful for updating everyone when something changes fundamentally in one service. So for example, when, a store, when the store is closed, the barista app sends a request to the config service saying it wants to close the store. That uh, puts a value in the DynamoDB table, which then the stream gets picked up to Lambda, which then goes to uh, EventBridge. Then every client who's listening, whether it's customers out there or it's the TV screen or other tablets we might have, then receive that event coming back through the WebSocket, and they can open and close the store all at the same time. It's kind of magic to see, actually. You press the open close button, and everything opens and closes around you. And there's very little code that we've actually written to make that work. One interesting thing that happened last year uh, with this was we ran out of milk. So in reInvent last year, we ran out of soy milk on day two. Soy milk was very popular. And we've never run a coffee shop before, so we panicked. We went to DynamoDB in the config service and took milk out of all of the configurations. And when we walked back in front of the booth, we were absolutely shocked to find that customers on their phones saw the milk disappear off the screen immediately. And for a while, we couldn't figure out how this was. I think we actually told everybody it's intentional, but it actually was really a surprise to us. And we realized the power of this type of model, that this data flows around this way, and you get these kind of benefits of being able to communicate with lots of providers. Imagine trying to do that without this type of approach. It would be fairly complicated. So CQRS with WebSockets is an interesting idea. And in our case, we're using IoT Core to do this. And this works with a very large number of subscribers. You know, IoT Core is a very, very scalable service. It's also very cost-effective messaging. And the PubSub routing mechanism it's using connects your publishers and your subscribers. So under the covers, the topic configuration in IoT Core and MQTT can mirror your event design. And I think this is really important when you're trying to connect these two things. So here's an example. So we've got multiple topics in Serverless Espresso. One of them are topics that only you care about. Your coffee is ready. It's unique to you and nobody else. So in this case, the topic is your user ID. And in this case, we can send a message to that one topic, and it's only going to that one subscriber. But there's also other topics, such as the TV screen and the barista app, that need to know about multiple coffee orders. They need to know order two is canceled, order three has been submitted, and so forth. 
but we don't want those going to the same people in topic one, so it's a different audience. There's also topic three, which is everybody. You've got this global topic of when something like a store is open or closed, literally everyone who's connected needs to be told this. And what's interesting is this is a fairly common pattern in applications where you've got customers and you've got admin applications. You've got a different scope of messages going backwards and forwards. And again, this would be kind of hard to do, but with topics, you can define the audience. You can use IAM to secure this using authenticated and unauthenticated roles. So when they log in, they get access to the correct topics. And then in the rules themselves, you can map between event attributes, the, the events going through your system, and these topics. And you can use content filtering rules as well to set up the wildcards. And that's how we manage with topic B, for example. Now, orchestration and choreography are two words that tend to strike fear into people's hearts when you hear them, because it's easy to get them the wrong way around. And I think it's easy to understand them from the context of what you're trying to do and which service you're trying to use. So orchestration with step functions is great for when you've got a process, often a business flow, where it's a rigid series of steps you need to be in control of. That if an error happens, that you can retry in the right places, and you can also track and observe what's happening throughout that entire process. Something like a payment flow would be a great candidate for orchestration, because you don't want to accidentally charge someone twice. You want to, you want to make sure the process is resilient enough that that would never happen. Choreography, on the other hand, is very different. This is where you've got microservices talking to each other and emitting events. And you have this flow that is the emergent property that's happening as a result of all of this. And where that happens, that creates this ability to extend and modify the functionality of your application. And generally speaking, what we discovered was you have orchestration within the bounded context of a microservice, and you've got choreography between microservices. We tried the other way around, where you have orchestration across microservices, and it gets very messy and confusing. And if you just use events without orchestration in some places, like imagine managing the coffee journey without orchestration, you end up with lots of undo logic all over the place and pathing logic. It becomes really very difficult to understand. But when you put these two together and you use them in the right places, it's extraordinarily powerful what you can build. And that's the main takeaway we took from Serverless Espresso. And the reason I wanted to do this talk was I think this combination of orchestration and choreography can really free you as a developer and give you enormous power with the types of applications you can build. Now, when you come from the API-driven world, and I think a lot of us have, this is an interesting thought, because often you think API-driven microservices are decoupled. And they are in the happy path. You know, if you look at this type of example, this is fine. But when something goes wrong, that's when you realize just how tightly coupled this can become. So imagine the fulfillment service in this example has an error. It then has to then tell all the other upstream services to undo whatever it is they were doing. So now suddenly they need API endpoints to all talk to each other. And what you've got here suddenly becomes uh, very tightly coupled and very monolithic. And so dealing with failures in this model is actually fairly difficult. Also, as your complexity grows, what tends to happen is you end up with services both upstream and downstream of this. And so that makes it even harder to keep in sync when you're trying to figure out when things go wrong. So going from that world to this world, it's a little bit different. And so with this world, all those services I've just shown are actually just producers and consumers on the event bus. You've got the step functions payment service, which again, just communicates with events. And in this case, when the fulfillment service has a problem like before, it simply emits an event saying an error has occurred. Anybody who's interested can subscribe to that action and then take action accordingly. But critically, the fulfillment service doesn't know or care who is consuming or listening to the event. And so these services are now absolutely decoupled in a way that they weren't previously. And if you get two new services arriving like before, like the subscription service or the loyalty service, these are just microservices you plug in. Anytime they need to speak to the outside world, you put the REST API. Otherwise, they're private, and they communicate with events. The step functions CRUD workflow is something I'm really interested in as a concept. And I hope if you use this, let me know how it goes, because we've had such a, an interesting result with, uh, using this pattern. How can you do this? Well, essentially, you've got one API gateway endpoint, and that starts the workflow. That's a direct service integration between the two. 
that first transition in the workflow decides the CRUD transaction that needs to happen based upon whatever's provided in the call. It uses service integrations wherever possible instead of Lambda functions. So this is something that came out about a year ago where you can use these transitions to directly integrate with step functions or Fargate or many other services. It's really very helpful. You still use Lambda or any other compute you prefer for your custom logic. And you can also use express workflows if you need to as well. And some of the benefits here are really amazing because you can actually reduce the complexity of a whole CRUD microservice potentially down to a single ASL file, which is just JSON. I mean, that's incredibly maintainable compared to having actual you know, regular um, programming language type code. It also can be easier to monitor and debug. It can be much simpler to implement retries and error handling, because that's natively built into the way step functions works. It doesn't rely on your code figuring out how to do this. It could be dramatically more cost effective, too, because you're pulling out Lambda functions and other compute in many cases. And you know, no compute is cheaper than no compute. I mean, really, you can get it down to a much lower number. It can reduce latency, too. When we moved to this model, we found that the workflows ran about 90% faster because they're just using service integrations. And as we started making changes, the versioning, again, that's part of step functions, made it a lot easier, especially across teams when we were deploying new versions of workflows. So considering how many different CRUD microservices there are out there, I'm really excited about this. I think it's a really interesting solution. Here's a couple of other patterns we found that I thought were interesting to share. So using workflows to manage waiting. So for transactions that involve waiting, where you're waiting on a human or another service, you can use a step functions task token. And instead of the idea I talked about earlier, where you're polling for some change and then taking action, you're simply configuring a transition to wait for a period of time. And you're paying for one transition, not the wait period. So whether you wait for five seconds or an entire year, the cost is exactly the same. Now to do this, what you do is you pass in the task token into EventBridge, and then you store that task token into DynamoDB, and then return that to the step function service when you're ready to restart. You can use the uh, SDK or API to then restart the workflow ready when you use the send task success API call. And this is a remarkably low code, simple way to handle very complex wait situations, especially when you've got thousands of transactions. So even in our case with the coffee situation, where we've got five minute timeouts, these are being managed for a thousand different orders, all by the service, and not with our own code. The emit and wait pattern was something we were interested in too. So this is a single workflow situation that is orchestrating some sort of production process with a series of milestones. And you have an event that's emitted into the event bus for each milestone. So the events here are produced by using the put events wait for task token method. And this allows the workflow to pause until receiving a resume command uh, with a corresponding task. So in this case, milestone one, start, milestone one starts, emits a task token to EventBridge. We pick this up with a Lambda function and store it in DynamoDB. We then resume operation by returning the task token. That continues on to milestone two, which does the same thing. The task token is sent to EventBridge. Again, this is triggering a Lambda function, which goes to DynamoDB. And at each stage, we can add this heartbeat value in the transition in seconds to determine how long we'll give it before it will fail and follow the catch path instead. This gives you this very precise second-based timeout. And so in the event that it does timeout, it follows that catch path and goes down the timed out wrap instead of the success route. And this is all managed for you. You can also remove polling using this approach too, which is really powerful. So I see customers build this type of uh, workflow on the right, where they have a situation where they're waiting for a value in a table to be there. And so they go to DynamoDB, fetch a value. If it's not what they're expecting, they go to a wait state and then try again in a few seconds or whatever the interval is. And the problem with this is that you are paying for transitions. So if you're waiting for a long time, you're actually increasing your cost. And of course, depending on your loop time, you're not, you're not getting the value immediately when it changes. So what you can do instead is get rid of the parts I've, I've shown the little scissor icons on, and instead have your, at the, at the top, have that token emitted into either EventBridge or an SQS queue, have your compute manage whatever it is it needs to do with that task, 
And then when it puts the, the item into DynamoDB, it then emits the task token for you and resumes the flow. It's actually a more elegant, simple solution, but you're reducing your cost down to a single transition in the workflow. So again, whether you're waiting seconds, minutes, hours, or days, it's still just a one transition cost. Much, much simpler. So I said at the very beginning, you know, cost was very important to me when we came up with this idea. I really did want to be standing with you here and say, I think I'm proud of what we did, that this is the most cost-effective solution, I think, for running a production coffee bar. Clearly, we could build this by putting it on a laptop and putting it under the desk, but when you want a highly available system that's running in the cloud, we've got multiple events happening all over the world, and really, if this were a production coffee system with multiple stores, we need something that's going to operate this way. So we run about 960 drinks per day uh, as a maximum with the default settings, and so when we ran this at a few events, I went back and looked at our AWS bill and looked at what it cost. And so the big number here is SMS because we're sending text messages to people all over the world. So that cost is about $8. But you'd incur that cost pretty much however you build this because that's just the cost of text messaging. But excluding that cost, when you look at all the other services that are involved, this entire service costs us well under a dollar a day. Now, that's actually less than the cost of a single cup of coffee we serve, strangely enough. But fundamentally, when you think about the total cost of ownership and the cost of developer time, the cost of managing code, suddenly this becomes dramatically cheaper than many other solutions. So I'm really happy with how this came out. I think this does actually represent a very cost-effective way to present this solution. So let me give you a quick summary of just a few things to, that we discussed. So, when we designed this, we started with the workflow. We then decided to attach microservices as it developed. And then we added front ends just to get a feel of what it looked like. This process really worked well for us. With microservices, we decided we wanted to communicate with events. We only used APIs if they were outward facing. We eliminated private APIs completely. This, again, was something that made it a lot easier to develop things very nimbly and on the fly. For real-time front ends, Really take a look at IoT Core as a solution. If you look at one of my repos, you'll see uh, I use this solution quite a lot. I used it before I worked at AWS when building mobile apps. It's actually a really strong solution for connecting with front ends. And effectively, it is a serverless web socket that you can run for very low cost. Use step functions for orchestrating within service boundaries and use EventBridge when you want to communicate across these boundaries. And then when it comes to combining orchestration with choreography, this is so extraordinarily powerful. And we're just really, that's the main takeaway we had from this whole experience. You can use this to create very extensible, low-code, cost-effective workloads. Now, the resources for this deck are also shown in the corner here at s12d.com forward slash svs312. I'd also like to point out to you a website that the DA team manages called Serverless Land. So if you're building serverless applications, this website has blogs, videos, it also has over 400 patterns, workflows, code snippets to help kickstart you on your serverless development journey. It's all, it's always available at serverlessland.com. And here at AWS reInvent, we've also started a number of different learning paths uh, available now, including skill builder, ramp up guides, and digital badges, which are new this week. Those are available at s12d.com forward slash serverless learning. Thank you so much for your time today. My name's James Bezik. Hope you enjoy the rest of your week here at AWS reInvent. Thank you. <laughs>